Now, if you got your Bibles, turn to Judges chapter six. We're gonna look at a guy named Gideon today. And I wanna challenge you to take a face step like we heard from our man in the baptistry that came forward right down this aisle, right here. Came down this aisle, talked to Pastor Loving Good just a few moments ago and said, it's time for me to take a face step. I think we all have face steps we need to take in our life, but face steps get us out of our comfort zone. Face steps get us into an area of risk. Matter of fact, if we know it can happen, it's not a step of faith, amen? And so we need to take face steps within our life. And I wanna walk you through Gideon and the process of taking a face step with him. If you've been to Israel, you've probably been to Gideon Spring. If you haven't been to Israel, I really encourage you to take that trip with your pastor sometime. It is an amazing trip. It is a trip worth going on. It truly is a bucket list trip and you'll get to go to the location in which this story took place. But if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Judges chapter 6 verse 1. I'll tell you what verse we're in because we're going to move along a little bit today and we'll all be all the way into Judges chapter 7 in a moment. We're just going to kind of preach and unpack this as we go. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, the Bible says, which was pretty normal for the Israelites. And for seven years, he gave them into the hands of a group of people called the Midianites. Now, the Midianites had actually been taken over by Moses long before. Then Joshua takes over the Israelites. Y'all know the story. They cross the Jordan and they come into the promised land, a land in which they were promised for years, a land in which God had guaranteed to them, which God never goes back on his promises, right? And, and we see that take place and they move in and they take over Jericho and they take over Ai and they keep going through the land of what we call Israel today, the land of Canaan. And as they begin to take over that land, the Lord through Joshua reminds them, don't stop fighting. Don't stop defending your land. There's still other people living in this land that you need to take over. You need to continue the journey. But the Israelites did not do it. And that's where the Midianites come in. Verse two says, because of the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain cliffs, caves, and strongholds. Matter of fact, if you fast forward to verse six, it says Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. They were desperate at this point in their life. Everything had been good for them and then everything got bad. Isn't that how it goes in our life? When life is good and we're experiencing a blessing of life, we don't go to our our God as much and thank him for the blessings. But when life gets bad and we hit the hard points in our life, what do we do? God, we need you. God, please help us. And we tend to forget about God and the blessings, but we tend to cry out to God in the pain. Why can we not do both? God wants to hear from us in our pain. God wants to hear from you in your tough times. God wants to hear from you in your struggles, but he also wants to hear from you for the blessings. And sometimes we don't recognize the blessings, so we never thank the Lord for how he blessed us. And sometimes we need a pause in our life and we need to say, God, thank you for the blessings. Maybe a face step for you today is to pause and recognize how you're being blessed and how the Lord has blessed you. He does that in this story. He reminds the people. Judges chapter six, verse seven through 10. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. This is what I've done. I brought you out of Egypt. I did it. Don't forget it. And out of the land of slavery, I did that. I rescued you from the hands of all the Egyptians and I delivered you from the hand of all the oppressors like I've done this for you. Don't forget it. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. They actually toiled the land. They actually worked the land and I gave that to you. They did all the work for you. I said to you, I am the Lord, your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites. I told you not to do it. In whom land you live. I told you not to follow the ways of the culture. I told you not to chase after the culture. I told you not to do what the culture says to do. I gave you the written word on what to do and what, but you have not listened to me. I wonder if the Lord would say that to us today. I wonder if the Lord would say, man, I, g I gave you the direction. I gave you the book. You didn't listen. And then you wonder why the attacks, you wonder where the blessing went. And it's like we become co so comfortable where we are that we forget where the Lord wants to take us. And quite honestly, comfort can be the enemy to a face step. 
Comfort is the enemy for us taking the next steps of faith because when we get comfortable, we don't continue to move forward because it's easy to live in our comfort, is it not? I wrote this down. Comfort stopped them from taking faith steps and moved them to indifference. They just didn't care anymore. We're good. We're good. Indifference created... Indifference had them move to the portion of when they would just follow into acceptance and because of indifference they accepted and they accepted the ways of the culture over obedience which completely allowed them to ignore their convictions. It would be like this, can I simplify it for you? In Oklahoma we have a lot of wind, right? Y'all remember the song? Oklahoma where the wind comes crashing through the plains. That was good, wasn't it, Jeff? I thought so. I thought, did y'all think that was good? Thank you. I really can't sing. You don't have to clap. It was terrible. Let's just be straight up, right? Y'all know the song, right? So I live in Oklahoma City on the west side of Oklahoma City where the wind really does crashing through the plains. We had two weeks this past year. It's been like the windiest year of our life. Some say rainy years. You might think tornadoes. I think wind. It's like a blow dryer this time of year because it's so hot outside and just wind. If it's 20 mile an hour wind, that's not wind. I'll come somewhere like this and you're like, man, it's a windy day. I'm like, what? is it? It's not windy. And then we had one day that it got upwards of 40 mile an hour wind. Now the wind's starting to blow. And then it's nothing for us to hit 70 mile an hour wind. I mean, that's like once a month. And that's a hurricane in some parts of the country. In our part of the country, it's just another day. We had one day that hit over 100 mile an hour wind. Woke me up in the middle of the night. I was like, what is going on? We look outside, it's just windy. It's just windy. I mean, it happens all the time. And here's what happens in the wind. Y'all know those little dandelion bushes that you picked up as a kid and you'd blow and they had spread all throughout and like plant seeds all over your yard? Well, this year, because the wind blew so well and so strategic, it happened to blow when the weeds were growing in our yard. So the dandelions blew in everybody's yard. So now in my neighborhood, the dandelions have come all over the place. I think they all came to my yard and I've got like a dandelion farm in my yard. I mean, I'm going to change my tax code to agriculture and start selling these things, right? I mean, there are, I mean, it's everywhere. Now, I've got an option. I care about my yard. Jeff, you care about your yard. I know you do. I've known you for years. You always have a nice yard. and you, I bet you get that thing sprayed. It looks good. You're out there mowing it straight lines. Well, Riley graduated, so you have somebody mow it for you. Uh, when I was at, you'd drive by... Jeff's house when Riley was a, was a young lad and the other two had, had grown up, you'd see Jeff out there and Riley be mowing the yard. Do it again. Straight lines. I remember, you remember? We care about our yards, right? Don't act like you do it any different, dads. And if you do do it different, shame on you. You ought to get out there and make your kid do it. Just sit there and watch him. Matter of fact, get a Coke while he's mowing. He look at you, why aren't you helping? Because I paid my dues, son, it's your turn, right? I mean, we're just trying to be good dads, amen? And we care about our yards and we want our yards straight and we don't want weeds in our yard. But what if this year, because the wind blew, I said, you know what? This is just the way it is in Oklahoma. I don't care anymore. And I looked at my son Parker and I said, Parker, we're not even gonna mow the yard this year. We're just gonna let it grow. And let the weeds grow and let the grass grow. And then we're going to bell hay at the end of the year. And it's going to be awesome. And we're just now we're not even going to pick the, we're not even going to pick the weeds in the flower bed. We're just going to let it all grow. Who cares? And then the president of the HOA, because God put it on some people's heart to be the most annoying person in the neighborhood. So they ran for president of the HOA. Amen. And so now they're sending to me, if that's you, I'm sorry that the Lord led you to do that. And so it's, it's part of like you're coming at it. And you're, you're sending me a note in the mail like, I'm going to put a lien on your house if you don't mow the yard and move your trash can, right? And it's like all oh, coming at me and, and here it comes and I just go, I don't care. That's called indifference. Can I say this to you though? A lot of times we get so comfortable where we are in our faith that we don't even care about the sin we're in anymore. We say, we don't care. My marriage is too messed up. I don't care anymore. What do I care? 
It's already, it's already messed up. I can't do it. I've already got that sin in my life. I can't shake it anyways. I've tried shaking it. I can't shake it. I'm just indifferent about it today. What do I care? It doesn't matter to me anymore. Just let it be. Or Man, my kids have already rebelled and they're running from God. I'm done praying for them. I don't care anymore. Like I'm just done fooling with it. I'm sick of it. We get indifferent. It's no different than if I just let the weeds grow in my yard, we let the sin grow in our life. We let the rebellion grow in our life and we do nothing about it. Can I tell you, that's where the Lord is challenging the Israelites. Y'all have done nothing about it. It's time to do something, but it takes a faith step to do something. It takes a faith step to believe that God can still work miracles. It takes a faith step to believe that, that God can still heal your marriage. It takes a faith step to believe that God can still heal my child that has been running. I love a family in my church. I've been in my church three years. I'll tell you a little bit about it in a moment, but I love a family in my church ever since I've been there for the past three years. Every Sunday I give an invitation and much like you guys, we have pastors standing up front and church leaders and people come and they get on their knees at the altar like we've had the past few services. Just people meeting with the Lord with whatever the Lord's working on them. And every single Sunday, a family came to the altar, husband and wife, hit their knees and they get up crying every Sunday, every Sunday, back there, every single Sunday. And as I got to know the family, I learned that they had a wayward child. And for years, they'd been hitting their knees on that altar. Every single Sunday, hitting their knees, begging God for their kid. They never quit. They never gave up. They never got content. They never got indifferent. And this past year, God did a miracle in their kid's life. He got put in a rehab. And then this past uh, week, he spent one year without any drugs or alcohol in him. One year, he had freedom took place. What if his parents would have said, we're tired of praying for him? You ever got frustrated at one of your children? Anybody? I'm not speaking to non-parents. Parents, if you haven't got frustrated at your kids, you're not a parent, right? Or you hadn't been paid, you hadn't gone home in a while, right? I can call my kids this afternoon. I'm sure I'll get frustrated at one of them, particularly my son, right? Like, why'd you do that? That doesn't mean I don't love him, just means he's normal, right? Just means we're all normal. We're going to get frustrated. Um, They could have just said indifference, but they kept going to the Lord. Why do we stop going to God? Because we don't believe that God really will. Maybe God's not moving in the midst of our lives, in the midst of our homes, in the midst of our churches, in the midst of America, in the midst of the world, because we don't really believe he'll move. See, belief is seen in the way we live, not in just the words we say. It's a reminder here for a faith step. That comfort became so normal, they just let sin stay in. Listen, if I encourage you with this, and I'll keep reading, uh, take care of the backyard. Take care of you. Keep taking faith steps. Keep repenting of sin. Keep growing in your faith. Take care of it. Take care of your church. Your church is a backyard so that you can reach the community that God placed you in. And this church does amazing at it. I mean, a thousand kids almost at camp? Come on, y'all. Y'all know how many churches do that across America? Maybe five at, at best. You know how I many churches across America won't see 77 teenagers saved in the entirety of their life? But y'all are seeing it in one week. God's doing something here. Don't get content in it. Get excited about it. See what the Lord would do. Come on, that'll preach. Are y'all fired up today? This is a third service. I can go as long as I want, so I'm just taking my time. Y'all better call Uber Eats. Get you something to eat. Just get them to bring it in. We're going to have a good time today. (laughs) Judges chapter 6, verse 11. Let's fast forward to there. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak, and it belonged to Joash. And this guy named his son name was Gideon there, and he's threshing wheat right there, it tells us in Judges chapter 6, verse 11. But he shouldn't have been threshing wheat. Why? Because it's in a wine press, and you don't thresh wheat in a wine press. But remember what I taught you or what the word of God said. The Israelites are hiding out. They're hiding. So what's what's Gideon doing is he's hiding so that the Midianites can't find him. He should have never been threshing wheat there. And it said, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, the man that was hiding, he said this, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Gideon's response is fantastic. Pardon me, my Lord. Wait, what? I just called you mighty warrior. 
I just called you like that this is who you are. I'm defining you, but you look at me, pardon me, my Lord. But if the Lord is with us, if you think I'm the mighty war, why has all this happened to us? Remember, God's already told them. I've already done all this. Well, now Gideon's questioning, where are all these wonders that our ancestor told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. Then in verse 15, he comes back, pardon me, my Lord. I mean, it's just not nice, right? Imagine one of your kids keeps saying this to you. Would you not just roll your eyes at them? Like I just told you one thing. You keep saying, pardon me. I wonder if God's ever just rolling his eyes at us like, God bless you. I blessed you and blessed you and blessed you and all you do is whine, 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 whine. Sometimes we need a good kick in the pants, right? Say, stop whining, grow up, deal with what the Lord's doing in your life, recognize it. I need that every now and then, we all need that. The Lord's leaning into Gideon here. Gideon replied, how can I save Israel? You call me mighty warrior. You're saying I need to be the one to go save Israel. Do you understand this about me, Lord? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh and I'm the least in my family. I'm not a mighty warrior, I'm a mighty wuss. I don't have what it takes, right? Like, I can't, this isn't me, I can't handle this. And he make an excuse after excuse after excuse because excuses are the greatest greatest enemy of faith steps. Excuses are the greatest enemy of faith steps. We make excuses why we can't instead of saying yes to what God has called us to do. That's why a lot of people have not said yes to Jesus. They make excuses. Well, I, I got to clean myself up first. The Bible doesn't say that. It says come just as you are. Well, I've been going to church a long time. What will people think of me? Who cares what they'll think of you? Eternity matters more than what people think of you on this planet, amen? And it matters. And so you need to respond to the gospel. Well, I, I just don't, I don't have all the answers. You don't have to have all the answers. Jesus says, I will take you just the way you are. We can't keep making excuses. But then at times we give our life to Christ. We never follow through in believers' baptism like our man did just a moment ago at three baptisms right here in this service. Baptizing every service today. Those are faith steps. See, after you're saved, you're to be baptized. And there's people in this church that have never been baptized and you never said yes to the faith step of obedience and being baptized and being baptized in your life and saying I'm going to be buried with Christ and rise and raise again and it's a journey that you're on and it's a step of obedience that you need to take. It's a faith step. Just like giving, giving's the same way. I teach our church about giving and about tithing. Tithing is a step of obedience and at times it's terrifying. Come on, somebody. Anybody ever been terrified to step into the obedience of giving? I remember back on my first job when I was making a lot of money, about $12,000 a year. I know you're jealous. But I was making bank, right? I was married, 12 grand a year, couldn't afford my apartment or my car. I was living the dream. And I remember a pastor set me down and said, Brian, I know you feel like you don't make much money, but you need to be obedient to the Lord with your money and tithe. I was terrified, y'all. I looked at my wife and she goes, I agree, I think we ought to be obedient in our giving. I'm like, what are we gonna give? It doesn't matter what, we're, like we don't have any money, but it's not about how much you give, it's about if you're obedient in it, that's the face step. See, that's the journey, it's obedience. And it's risk in life that we take that are step of obedience. Those are faith steps. Those are steps in the journey and we can't make excuses to run from them. We can't make excuses as a church to run from what God calls us to do. I love what Pastor David Landreth, who many of you have met in your life, who I've had the privilege to work with Jeff and David, he used to always say this, we're more afraid of missed opportunity than we are change. Why? Because we'd be willing to change it all if God calls us to do it because we want to take a faith step. We also want to say yes to what the Lord wants, not what we want. The reason we resist a change in life, I say this to my church all the time, the reason we would resist change is because it's about us. Whoo! Then we stepped outside of what God wants. Don't step outside of what the Lord wants for your church, amen? Just because it inconveniences us. I know it's not fun, but if it's of the Lord, it is right. And that's where the Israelites were. Man, it, it, they were at this moment. 
and they needed a hero. And they looked at Gideon, a non-hero, a weakest of these, and he calls him mighty warrior, which let me just give you this encouragement. God sees you for who you were created to be, not for who the world says you are. The world said Gideon was the weakest. God says you're the strongest. The world says you can't lead the people. God says you will lead the people. The world says you don't have the, the leadership to do this. God says I'll give you the leadership to do this because God takes the unqualified and he qualifies them. And if I can tell this to everybody in this room today, I don't care if you're a dad in the room today and you don't feel qualified to be a dad, I'm telling you God Almighty will qualify you and you can and you will. If you don't think you can be the right spouse for your spouse, I'm just telling you God will qualify you. Take the face step and follow the Lord. If you don't feel like that you can be used by God, you feel like, man, I can't go to a restaurant and pray over a waiter or waitress. I don't know how to pray. Why don't you just ask them, how can I pray for you? And just take the face step and start reaching the people right in front of you. Same place at work. When you go to work, why not win the person next to you to Christ because you shared the gospel with them. Don't just invite them to church. Share Jesus with them. Well, I don't know if I have enough to say. Stop worrying about if you got it and trust the Lord to give it to you as you open your mouth. It's a face step. It's a journey. Be a mighty warrior for the Lord. You can, and God will equip you. God will not leave you hanging. I 100% believe it. And then so what's Gideon do? He says, all right, Lord, I'm gonna put this fleece out front, and I want you to put dew on it tonight if this is of you. God does it. All right, Lord, you did that. Now I want you to dry it up. God does it. You can just see him getting frustrated at God, can't you? Man, I knew that wasn't gonna happen. And then God puts do on it again the next night, like Gideon requested. It's like the Lord was just showing him, I, I'm in this. But it's almost like Gideon wanted 100% proof. And 100% proof is not a face step. 100%, like if it, if it makes sense, I don't think it's a face step. If you're just like, yeah, that makes sense. Are you really taking a face step? It ought to stretch you a little bit. Like when I went to pastor my church, I'll never forget Jeff, remember? I talked to Jeff a hundred times about it. And we felt like the Lord had led us to go pastor a church and that God was gonna take us to do this. We're living in Northwest Arkansas, a place called Cross Church. We were the collegiate pastor. I was chaplain for the University of Arkansas football program. I was a teaching pastor within the church. And so I, I, we had a great opportunity and a great journey where we are, but we felt like God told us to go. But we thought we'd go to more of an established church, a little bit larger of a church. And in the midst of that, a, a church in Trinity Baptist Church in Yukon, Oklahoma, where Garth Brooks is from. Amen. And called us and said, would you consider talking to us? And we were, quite honestly, they had called us so much. A guy named Reese Cole, who is a great, great friend of mine today, called us so much, we felt obligated. And so we met them. I was preaching at a particular church in Tulsa. They came up. We met them in a hotel. And as we sat there in the hotel, we booked a dinner on the other side of that night because we really didn't want to be there. And then heaven fell. You ever been in a moment when heaven just falls? Just anointing of God falls? Um, and Jennifer and I walked back out to our car that night and we're like, those are the greatest people we ever met in our life. See, a church isn't about a building, it's about the people in it. And we thought these are the greatest people we ever met. So we drove down to go check this church out. The church had gone through some struggles in its life. It had grown to about 800 at one point in its life and then it, it had grown from about 800 and grown all the way up to about 400. And, uh, and just, it was on its way down. Some of you are like, that's not up, you know that, I get it. Just always assume positive intent, amen? And uh, my glass is always half full. It's never half empty, right? Um, and we, we, the church had been through some tough times and I call them the faithful 400. The 400 people that stayed within the church, about 300 of them were showing up consistently. And uh, in the midst of that, we went and we just fell in love with the faithful 400. And we felt like God could do something here. I remember looking at them one time and I said, can y'all even pay us? And one of them looked back and goes, we can't afford not to have you. That's a nice way to say we ain't got no money, but you ought to come. <laughs> Me? All right. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, let's give it a shot. My wife and I look at each other and we really felt like it was of the Lord and we took a face step to step into a journey that we had no idea what it would look like. We had no idea what God would do. We had no idea financially how it would work out. We just wanted to trust the Lord. It did not make sense, y'all. 
And that was three years ago today. Today is my three-year anniversary at the church I'm currently at. And that church has, has roughly grown from those faithful 400. Today, they'll probably have 1,500 people show up at that church, and there'll be people come to know Christ. There will be probably 20 plus visitors that show up at that church today. And it's because the people of God got fired up about the things of God, and they started going to reach the people of their community, and they took a faith step, and they just said yes to the journey, and the people are watching the church grow. We say together we are advancing the mission, right? Together we're reaching people. Together we are discipling people together we are sending people why because we all together 400 people gathered together and said let's take a faith step and just see what God would do and get rid of all the rules that's a faith step and we're watching God move we took a risk we got to take risk we can't have all the answers we're not going to have it all figured out then the Lord, so then the Lord calls Gideon to go build this army to take over. Gideon says, yes, he goes to build the army. As he builds the army, it comes to the point in Judges chapter seven, two, the Lord said to Gideon, you've got too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into your hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. You can't do it this way because you're gonna boast about me. You know, when we took this step to go pastor, I pastored June 2019, I went by By March of 2020, y'all remember March of 2020? I'll tell you where you were, home. All right, I'm a prophet, I know where you were. You were at your house, all right? In March of 2020, I'm sitting down with my leadership team and God had advanced a mission within our church and the mission in our church was called Faith Clinic. It ministered to 14% of uninsured people in our community. We give them free medical care so that they can have medical care since they don't have insurance. And as a result, we share the gospel with them. And, we, and that ministry is growing, we're out of space. Our food pantry and our community's floor was falling through and we wanted to help our food pantry. We wanted to have a clothing boutique to start helping people have clothes in our community. We didn't have money as a church, had a little over a million dollar budget as a church at the time, so we didn't have, we were barely covering what we had, and we were trying to advance a mission. We felt like God told us in the middle of 2020, in the middle of COVID, that we need to build a facility for Faith Clinic, Man and Pantry, and Woven. We call it the Together We Center, and that we ought to build it cash money. So I went to our church, and I said, church, I feel like we need to add a million dollars to our budget this year and we got six months to hit it. By the way, the whole year we needed a million dollars. We just took a face step. It didn't make sense. We're just taking a risk. God wanted to make it so it'd have to be all about him. We raised over $1.3 million and still brought in like 1.8 as a church. All because we said, yes, it didn't make sense. You can't tell me that's not God. That's just the Lord, y'all. I promise, y'all have already figured out this guy couldn't lead that, right? Some of you are wondering how in the heck does he pastor a church, right? Like, there's no way. There's no way some redneck from Arkansas could step in and lead something so amazing. That's only the Lord. That's a faith step when we're stepping into only what God wants and that's where the Lord wanted to lead the Israelites and when you fast forward, they get into it and, and he says, hey, you got too many men and let's, del- let's get rid of some of these men. Let's take these men out and, and move these men on and they need to go. Why? Because anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave and there's a lot of men that were afraid of taking a faith step and when fear steps in you miss out on movements of God because you leave them and you run from them stop running from what God wants to do in your life come on somebody that'll preach and then the Lord says you still got too many men and he leads them to a river and there's a group of men that bend down and they lap up the water and they drink the water like a dog I love dogs Right? I got, well, I don't love all dogs. I got two labs and I got a Yorkie. Nobody loves a Yorkie. Anybody's it's like, we all hate Yorkies, right? I hate my, anyway, some of you love yours. You're mad at me over it. Jeff dot loving good at first Baptist Cleveland.com, whatever it is. Um, but I'm, I'm there, right? And I'm, I'm, you're, they're lapping it up like dogs. And then the few, 300 of them got down on a knee, kept their eyes up. They're ready. And they took the water and they drank it. And the Lord said, I don't need the many. I just need the mighty. I need the ones leaned in ready. I need the ones that are eyes up. I need the ones that are focused in. I need the ones that are locked in. See, that's where the Lord needed. That's how I see my church. The Lord needed a group of people, the faithful 400. They were down, they were ready. They were drinking the water and said, let's, let's be used, God. 
Let's go reach our whole community. Let's go reach 100 plus thousand people that live in our community. Let's go do this. In the name of Jesus, we believe that God can move. The eyes were up. Can I tell you, if you want to take a face step in your life, you got to get your eyes up and you got to believe that God can use you bigger than you've ever been used in your life. You just got to be ready to go. You don't have to be fully equipped. They weren't equipped. They were just willing. The question is, are you willing? 